Hello everyone, my name is Rasha, and I will be presenting our paper Gradient and Log-Based Active Learning for Semantic Segmentation of Crop and Weed for Agricultural Robots. I will start by motivating our work. There are many applications where it's important for a robot to understand and interpret the scene it finds itself in. One such application that we address in our paper is automated weed control, where the robot has to distinguish between crop and weed. This is a semantic segmentation task where every pixel in an image captured by the robot has to be labeled. Once the semantic segmentation model is trained on one agricultural field, we would like to transfer this knowledge to another field of the same crop. However, images from different fields will most likely have different statistics of crop and weed. They can also vary the type of soil they show, the weather conditions, the crop growth stage, and possibly image artifacts. This makes it difficult to simply reuse a previously trained network to infer the labels on another field. Models have to be refined with new labels, and our goal is to reduce this human labeling effort. You can see here an overview of our active learning approach. We first perform a very weakly supervised segmentation to obtain foreground masks that act as pseudo-ground truth. These are then fed into a previously trained encoder-decoder segmentation network to produce different ranking measures of the unlabeled images. One such ranking scheme is then applied and a human annotates the highest ranking samples. These are then used to refine the network. We will next detail these steps. The first step is to generate pseudo-ground truth that will be used to rank the samples. We found that a rough foreground-background segmentation is suitable for our application which we obtained with a simple clustering method. We randomly sampled 10 images and run k-means on the values of their RGB channels to obtain 20 clusters. After viewing a single image with all those clusters, a human annotator chooses which clusters to present vegetation. For the data in our experiments, two clusters were enough to obtain rough foreground masks. Having obtained pseudo-ground truth, we now move on to the different ranking schemes. The first one is based on the loss of the network. Given that training neural networks with backpropagation is driven by the loss, it can be an indication of the segmentation error, and therefore provides a useful cue as to which samples the network will most benefit from. We compute the focal loss based on the pseudo-ground truth. We found that training only on the images with the highest loss values didn't generalize well. This could indicate that they're not representative enough of the overall dataset. Therefore, we employ a scheme instead that samples images with a diverse range of loss values, but prefers those with higher losses. We sort the images by their loss in a descending order, and then select them uniformly on a logarithmic scale. Since the samples are sorted, this approach would more heavily select those that have higher loss values, while not completely discarding images that the network is performing well on. For this ranking scheme and the following one, we pick those samples for annotation that might have the largest impact on the network weights. The norm of the network gradients is a measure that is indicative of which samples will affect the weights more than others. Although the loss and norm of gradients are correlated, there are instances where the loss could be high for certain samples, yet the gradient is locally small. As in the previous approach, we use labels from very weakly supervised segmentation as pseudo-ground truth. We run the network on the training images for one epoch and compute the gradients. We know that this step is only used to compute the gradients, but the network weights remain unchanged. Once we have the gradients, we compute the L2 norm of those in the last two layers of the network. The images are sorted based on this measure in a descending order, and again we pick samples on the log space scale as explained earlier. The log space in the previous approaches was used to ensure that there is enough diversity among the samples so that the network doesn't overfit on them and can generalize to unseen data. Here, we use a different method that relies on the space spanned by the gradients, where we project onto the orthogonal complement of the gradients of the selected samples. The residual we are left with indicates which samples have the strongest remaining effect on the weights after accounting for the already selected samples. We select images one by one, each time sorting them according to this measure and choosing the one with the highest norm of the residual. To pick the first sample, we choose that with the highest norm of the gradient. We next describe our experimental evaluation. The sugar beet datasets we used in our experiments were acquired with the Bosch Deep Field Robotics UGB. The robot was developed to assist in several agricultural applications, including mechanical weed control, 
and selective herbicide spraying. It's equipped with multiple sensors, including cameras. For our experiments, we only use the RGB data provided by the camera. The data was captured in three different fields, Bonn and Stuttgart in Germany, and Zurich in Switzerland. The datasets have weed and crop plants at different stages of growth, and the images vary, their illumination, soil type, and class statistics, as can be seen in the images here. The notations include three classes, weed, crop, and soil, or miscellaneous. The table here shows the number of images in each dataset and the ratio of foreground pixels. We can see that there is a high imbalance of classes in the data. The experiments we ran are designed to show how the proposed sample selection strategies impact the performance of the network in the new environment. We first train a model on the bond sugar beet dataset, then refine the trained model on the other two datasets by incrementally selecting batches of samples. To quantify the performance, we use the mean intersection over union as the performance measure. We list in the table in the top here the IOU for each dataset when running the model without any refinement, as well as when training on all of the samples. These serve as a lower and upper bounds per hour refinement. The figures here show the performance of the two datasets when selecting samples for annotation with different methods. As baselines, we include random sampling and selecting those samples with the highest entropy. We can see here that the effect of the sampling method is stronger when only a few images are selected. As the model is trained on more and more samples, the accuracy plateaus as expected, and the variation between the different methods decreases. It can be noted, however, that random sampling has a lower performance even with a greater number of images. We can also see that when training the model with only a handful of images, the methods that take into account the impact of the samples on the weights lead to better generalization to the rest of the unseen data. To further quantify the performance of our approach, we use the object-wise metric, where the accuracy is measured for objects larger than 50 pixels. Since the target application is weeding with agricultural robots, this metric is more directly useful than pixel-wise performance. Each row in the tables here shows the mean accuracy when incrementally selecting 10 samples with the different methods, then refining the network with the selected samples. For comparison, random and entropy-based sampling are shown in the first and second columns respectively. The numbers in bold indicate the highest values. In the paper, we also compare it to other baselines. To further analyze the ranking methods and inspect potential patterns in the different sampling approaches, we plot the t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding of the gradients. Each circle in the figure here denotes the 2D embedding of the gradient of a single image before picking the first 10 samples. Samples selected by each method are shown in different colors. As explained earlier, we combined the idea of gradient-based selection with two alternative approaches to achieve diversity in the selected images, either picking on a log scale or projecting out gradients of samples that have been selected previously. In our experiments, both strategies performed well. When inspecting the gradients of the samples selected in the figure here, we found that the strongest gradients cluster together, near the top left. A more detailed breakdown of the method's performance on the weed and crop classes is shown in the tables here. The table on the left shows the pixel-wise precision and recall on the Stuttgart dataset after selecting the first 10 samples. Both methods, gradient norm and gradient projection, have high recall and precision values for the crop class without degrading those of the weed class. The object-wise performance of the second table further illustrates the effectiveness of these methods. Again, gradient norm and gradient projection produce high precision and recall for both classes. To conclude, our goal in this work was to facilitate automated weed control and reduce human labeling effort for semantic segmentation. Our target application is transfer learning of segmentation models between agricultural fields with different appearances and statistics. We design gradient and log-based sampling strategies that make use of pseudo-labels and evaluate their performance on two agricultural datasets. Our results show the effectiveness of our method as it produces higher segmentation accuracies with a small number of training samples compared to random sampling as well as entropy-based sampling. Thank you for your interest in our work and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.